Welcome to the Crack House Chronicles True Crime Podcast. I am Donnie, and with me is a man that says the only essential oil you need is bacon grease. Ain't that right? Is Dale. <laughs> you got to have a big old glob of bacon grease. You got to, man. You got to. I mean, who wants that elderberry and all this other stuff when you can have bacon grease? That's right. Just slather it on. What's going on, dude? <laughs> oh, same old, same old. Working hard and ready to have some fun. We're going to have some fun with this podcast. Yeah. It's always fun. You got any good shout outs? Anybody you want to talk about or mention today before we I, get started? I do have uh, one little thing here to spin off. We would like to uh, give a uh, big thanks to a uh, friend of the show, uh, Mary Catherine. Mary Catherine Woods. We, uh, we appreciate you. Uh, she's been uh, sharing a good word, uh, you know, the gospel, if you will. And uh, she's brought in uh, Janet Williams into the Crack House family, and we really want to welcome her in, and uh, thanks for listening. Those folks have started listening to our episode, and man, we appreciate it a whole bunch. That's right. That word of mouth stuff works good. God, don't it, though? I'm telling you. Yeah. And that and sharing stuff, and that's about all I got for this week. That's all you got? Mm hmm. Sorry. We want to remind everybody to. <laughs> <laughs> we want to remind everybody to go to the website, go to the store page, buy you something. That's right. Yeah. It seems like when we do these episodes, when we record them, stuff's on sale. But then I know it yeah. every day. Yeah. We it's need like, ooh, ooh, stuff's on sale. Well, I guess it won't we need be to do better. Money. Do better putting it on our social media. The stuff's on sale. Yeah. My bad. That's all right. <laughs> yeah, I forget to, and I see it's on sale, and then I forget looking, about it. I just be looking at it, wanting to buy me something. Yeah. Go shopping. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And if anybody wants to go to Apple Podcast and leave a five star and write something in the box. Write people. something in the box. That way I'll have uh, something to shout out. Yeah. <laughs> if you do that, if you write something in the box, it shows up and we get a notification that somebody has left a review and we'll give you a shout out. Ain't that the truth? You've got that right, man. That YouTube comments. Yeah. Stuff just. Just blow us up. We'll, we'll talk about you. We will talk about it. We'll, we'll say something about you. <laughs> and we're still not on Samsung, but we're trying. It's not there. I don't know why it's not uploading to Samsung. I'm telling you, as many times as I searched it to see if we're there yet, they should be getting some kind of <laughs> algorithm. Telling. Every day, Dale says, guess what? We're still not on Samsung. <laughs> every day. Yeah, every day. A couple times a day. Yeah. <laughs> I really, I have done all I can do on my end okay. to make it work. We'll see. So, oh, y'all start blowing them up. I know. Our podcast host says is their, their tech support is pretty bad apparently yeah i've tried to contact them and and all i get is an automated messaging thing and says that it doesn't give me any option to for podcast help that's the samsung folks not our not our guys yeah the our, samsung our, people our guys are good yeah they do really good yeah all right dale we're gonna get into our case this week okay and we've got a disappearance disappearance yeah the last time we did a episode from maine was kathy marie moulton little girl went missing there we interviewed kevin katie I think that was what episode? Episode 30. Episode 30. God, that was way back. Way back. Way back. But we've got a disappearance from Maine from 1975. Speaking of way back. Yeah. <laughs> the 70s. Yep. And this is the disappearance of Kurt Ronald Newton. Kurt Newton. Yep. Kurt Newton. Sounds like a NASCAR driver. Sure does. <laughs> but he went missing on August the 31st of 1975. And just a little bit of description of kurt he was born on july 28th of 1971 he was four years old at the time he was a white male height three foot one inches weighing about 35 pounds and he had strikingly blonde hair yeah and medium length mm -hmm. with blue eyes pretty little feller yep and the last thing he was seen wearing he was wearing a navy blue jacket a blue sweatshirt with the word Manchester across the front, some brown corduroy pants, and blue suede ankle high shoes. A blue pair of shoes. Blue suede shoes. <laughs> easy for you to say. He, yeah, <laughs> easy. Yeah, easy for me to say. But now the Kurt, he was the son of Jill and Ronald Newton. They were from Manchester, Maine, and Kurt had an older sister that was two years older than him. Her, her name was Kimberly. Kimberly. And they were from Manchester, and they were going camping Labor Day weekend of 1975. But they were going to the Natanis Campground. This is located in Chain of Ponds, Maine, and it's just about six to seven miles south of the Canadian border. So it's up there pretty close to That's way up there. Canada. Mm -hmm. And this is going to play a little bit into this a little bit later. Shout out to my boy Joe in Canada. Up there in Canada. <laughs> But they were going camping, and they, they got to the Natanis campground. This is on a Friday of Labor Day weekend. 
and they had just purchased a second-hand pop-up camper. Heck, yeah. And Jill had described it as their luxury or our luxury. Yeah, I'm sure they were really excited. This is their first trip in their new camper. Yep, and they were avid outdoorsmen. They loved camping, getting outside, and going camping. But they had uh, gathered some firewood along an abandoned logging road. This was nearly a mile from their campsite. And they'd always said that camping isn't a, isn't camping without a bonfire. Right. And on Saturday, their friends arrived at the campground, and the kids had taken toys with them, Dale. They had, uh, Kurt took his tricycle with him, and I think Kimberly, his older sister, took her bicycle and some Barbie dolls, as we had been described. Mm-hmm. And they loved riding through mud puddles and just having a good big, big old time just there. Just a big old time. Yeah. There in the campground. And this was an end of summer deal for them because school was getting ready to start back and they were just ready to relax and have a good weekend with the family and just having a, a good time that's right mm-hmm. they said things just felt right yeah just to go have a good time with family and friends up there and that sunday morning the sun had rose and i think kurt had slept late that morning i think he had slept about nine o'clock yeah, I think they got there Friday, right? Yeah. And then uh, I think all their friends showed up Saturday, so I'm sure they had a, a big day on Saturday. All mm-hmm. of them playing and stuff, and so that's probably why he was sleeping in late. Yeah. Because, mm-hmm. you know, you're out camping like that, you're going to sleep. You'll be wore out. Yeah. yeah. No doubt about it. Mm-hmm. And the kids were playing, and Ron had got up and fixed breakfast there, and he'd fixed fried potatoes, ham, eggs, toast, and I think he had some juice. Mm-hmm. And... Kurt was eating a donut on a stick. <laughs> it had been warmed up over the fire. Yep. And Ronald, the dad, had threw all the trash, the paper plates into the fire, and Jill was gathering up all the, I guess, the dishes and maybe some clothes, and she was going to take them to the bathhouse. Yeah, I think she grabbed their, their muddy shoes and stuff as well. Mm-hmm. And she was going to the bathhouse with one of her friends to get everything washed up. Yep. And the kids were playing – uh, Kurt's older sister Kimberly had been playing a game and Kurt was just riding his tricycle around the campsite just having a big old time and while Jill was gone Ron the dad was going to get some firewood mm-hmm. they were getting low and it, the nights were going to get cold and he had gotten in a vehicle with Bob Walker Right. and he had been described that he had gotten in a the vehicle they had gotten into Ron's Bronco Right. I don't know which one had happened well, but, we'll go with the Bronco. But they that were, cool. them two guys were going together. They to grabbed get, an axe and went to go get the firewood. They were going to get firewood. Right. And like I said, the kids were playing around. And when he left, uh, it was heard that Kurt apparently hollered out, Daddy, Daddy, and tried to catch him riding his tricycle. Yeah, he probably just looked up and realized they had left. And he was like, I'm going to jump on my, my ride and see if I can catch up. Yeah, he was going to pedal away. Mm-hmm. Focused. But they were heading up the road to a, the old logging road to get firewood mm-hmm. and this was when uh, kurt had passed a little girl she was about 11 years old her name was lou ellen hansen and she was coming back from a walk and she hollered out at him and said hey do your parents know where you are mm-hmm. and he didn't reply at all he didn't even look up right he was focused yeah he just kept on pedaling she's trying to do the right thing though. that's pretty smart on her part be 11 years old right mm-hmm and Jill was just getting back from, I guess, washing the clothes, the dishes, or whatever they had to wash up. And Kurt was nowhere to be seen. And she was asking people around the campsite, have you seen Tricycle? Have you seen Kurt? And nobody had seen him at all. And she began to think the first thought was that he may have gone with the men to get firewood. But she kept looking around, and there was no Kurt. No Kurt at all. Mm-mm. And this was when a, a guy named Jack Hanson, he was the... Dale, I think he was the camp caretaker. Yeah, yeah, he looked after things there. He was a, a volunteer caretaker. He was a retired uh, teacher, and he had uh, been volunteering there for for several years. Mm-hmm. And he was also the dad of Llewellyn Hanson, that the girl who saw him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was just getting back to the campsite when um, they were looking around for for Kurt, and this is when he had told them that he had spotted a tricycle up near the dump. Mm-hmm. And he threw it in the dump. Yeah, he thought it had just been discarded and left up there, so he just took it and chunked it in the dump. Just sitting there on the side of the road, which me and you have talked about this, and I think this was 
It's weird. It is weird. Very, very weird situation. Me, a person who throws away nothing, would definitely have not thrown a perfectly good tricycle into the trash. Because you know he had to see Kurt riding around on this thing. Or at least, you know, I mean, if you go and look at it and it's it's tore up, wheels bent or something, sure. But if you look at it and it's, it looks, you know, I mean, it might have been dirty, but, but you know, everything's functionally working properly. Why mm-hmm. would you not just take it back to the campground, if nothing else, just so it would be there for other kids to play with? Yeah the way i'm thinking you know exactly but he told him that uh he had spotted a tricycle and put it in the dump everybody freaked yeah jill she and some of her friends they took off to the dump mm-hmm. and they pulled the tricycle out of the dump and jill's first words were my god someone's taking him wow that was her first instinct dale mm-hmm. but the guys there were just sort of thinking that kurt just wandered off and Looking for the guys. Right. Well, you know, probably the way it looked, it probably looked like he had pulled up on the tricycle and pulled over to the side of the road there and then walked down in the woods looking for him. Mm-hmm. But, you know, as I say, you know, he he was kind of terrified of the woods himself to be alone. He said even uh, at their home, he wouldn't go into the woods. Even when his sister wanted him to go into the woods, he would never do it and go in the house and tell his mom that there's monsters in the woods he wasn't going in yeah so she probably knew right then that he's probably not wandering around in the woods by himself because mm, kurt was one to to have, be close to his mom right anytime they would go anywhere he got if she got out of his sight i mean he would start crying yeah he was a um, he's a little mama's boy yeah nothing wrong with that so it just makes me wonder him peddling off like that and this is all within you know five ten minutes yeah it's not a long period of time at all there was a guy, Dwayne Lewis. He was the main fish and game warden inspector, and he was patrolling near his home in Phillips, Maine. This was about 70 miles south of Chain of Ponds when the call came in from the regional game warden that a child was lost. Hmm. And a small search party had already been organized from the campers there at the Chain of Ponds and Natanas campground right. to comb the logging roads. And Lewis was 39 and a veteran warden with 14 years and nearly 75 searches under his belt. And, yeah, he was definitely the man to have. Yeah. And no search of which Lewis had been in charge had failed to find a missing person in so, the woods. You know, he was a whole lot. No, I mean, he never, he always got his man. If in, you in were world. lost, he was the man to have. Yeah, definitely. Because, the you know, a missing boy of only four, and the temperature expected to drop in the 20s that night. Mm, that's not good. No, Lewis called area wardens for assistance. So already they're getting, you know, multi, uh, multi-unit multi help. And everybody was heading north to the Chain of Ponds, yes. in the Tannis campground. Because it's way out there in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's a town within like 30 miles of this place. I know. Besides, unless you go over to Canada Line, and I don't know how far it is that way to a to a town, so it's it's pretty desolate. But Lewis, he was convinced that it's much harder to plan for a search for a small child, but equally convinced when he arrived at the scene about 4 p.m. that with 29 searchers already at hand, the boy would be home by nightfall. He was pretty confident that they were going to find Kurt Newton. Well, it's pretty impressive, you know that. I mean, he got there and there's already 30 people looking. You mm-hmm. know, so everybody's everybody's on board here. Yep. And they even had a helicopter and search plane on the way there. Mm-hmm. Well, Kurt had always been fascinated with helicopters. And even when, when one would come over his house, he would always be fascinated by them, you know, looking up at them. And Jill even got up in one of the helicopters and was on the loudspeaker, Dale. And she kept hollering on the loudspeaker, Kurt, I'm in the helicopter. Your mommy and daddy are waiting for you. I want you to follow me back to the camp. Walk towards the helicopter. Don't sit down and don't be afraid. Just stand up and walk and I'll take you back. So it seems like to me they're doing everything right. Mm -hmm. You know, in pretty damn quick. Yeah. But later, Jill would consider the first day's efforts and say even if he'd somehow gotten out of the prime area, that helicopter would have brought him back. Right. So I think Jill, in the back of her mind the whole time, she was pretty convinced that he was taken. Yeah, I mean, she's probably, you know, doing her best she can to, to hope he's not. But that was her first reaction. Mm-hmm. But like we said, Dale, the temperature was getting down into the low 20s that night. 
right mm -hmm. and she was freaking out she's probably thinking that you know Kurt's just wondering why don't, why don't they come and get me yeah you know it, so she's beating herself up already mm -hmm. that's not good yep now by daybreak on labor day a bloodhound team sent it on kurt's pajamas and a year earlier the same bloodhounds had been instrumental in tracking a two-year-old uh girl that was lost in new sharon woods so these girl, these these dogs were pretty trained yes and the weather kept getting worse mm -hmm. and one searcher said it was dark dank and miserable with the fog setting in and everybody was soaking wet and chilled to the bone yeah and by now the search party had grown to nearly 200 people wow and that's quick but these woods dale they were filled with holes and some bigger than a man mm -hmm. and fishing game warden Dwayne lewis said that piles of rocks and boulders covered with moss and enormous root cavities so a place where anybody could get in and just disappear right meanwhile this you know they said that uh, the hounds they had uh run up to the dump you know and they ran about 10 yards and then they'd whirl around another way and run and just kind of in confusion, it was just kind of getting overwhelmed by all the conflicting uh, scents mm -hmm. where everything's going on. So that's not good. No. You know, it's just not looking good. But they were looking for a Kurt everywhere, and the search team was getting bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. And Mainers from all walks of life, buses brought workers from paper mills, factories, from throughout northern and central Maine. Uh, college students, uh, woodsmen, and all kinds of people were coming from everywhere to look for this little boy. This was the biggest search party ever, yeah, in, ever, in the state of Maine. Mm -hmm. And cars were lined up on Route 27 for more than a mile. Wow! People looking for Kurt. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. And people were even coming in cooking meals for the searchers, Dale. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, everybody that wasn't searching was doing something to help. Right. You know, I even heard that a lot of the ladies in the auxiliary and stuff, they were cooking for up to 1,500 people. Wow. That's a lot of meals. But the Newtons, they were determined that nothing was going to be left out. And Jill had learned from a searcher that a top-secret plane had been used in Vietnam to find gorillas in, like, dense jungles. And she ran to the ward, and she said, I don't care what it costs or how it works. I want them to tell me where my son is. Right. So, <laughs> so that Monday night, that $10 million gunship flew in from Florida. Yeah, Pensacola, Florida, with a nine-man crew. And this is the first time it would be, be used in a civilian search. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy, man. Mm -hmm. And the plane was equipped with infrared sensors and low-light television sensor equipment for nighttime use. So in 1975, this is probably top-of-the-line stuff. Yeah, it's got to be. Yeah. And Jill was excited yeah, they said it's so sensitive it could detect the heat differential between a, a white median strip and the blacktop road at 10,000 feet. That's that's awesome, That's man. pretty sensitive, yeah. Yeah. But Jill got excited when she heard the plane was on the way. Mm -hmm. But Ron, who was very protective about letting me get my hopes up, she said, cautioned, it's just a machine. Don't put much on it. Right. And So he's trying to keep a level head here. Yeah, he, he is. And Ron, I mean, man, this guy, he was... A go-getter. Yeah. He wasn't sleeping. He was constantly. Refused to rest. Yes. And on Monday, returning wearily from a, the woods at dusk, Ron tripped and fell in a deep gully. And One he, of them holes. Yeah, he turned his ankle over. And it turned purple and black and blue. And it swelled up twice its size. Mm. And the doctor ordered him off his feet. Mm -hmm. But he continued. No, that wasn't going to work. Yeah, I mean, I'd be the same way. I would be out there. Yeah, definitely. And he went about four nights. Four nights with no sleep. Yeah. And it was at one point, uh, his friends, I guess just out of desperation, they laced his coffee with uh, tranquilizers. Yeah, because he was continually drinking coffee just to keep himself awake. So mm -hmm. they, they, they knew they had to do something, even though it's kind of a little sketchy there. And I don't know if you can get away with it nowadays. But, I mean, and I guess they was doing it for his own good. Just He had to get some sleep. Yeah. And Wednesday night, this was his fourth night without sleep, the tranquilizers finally took effect. And his speech sort of slowed, and he just just collapsed yep. and got some much-needed rest. But it was said, uh, Dwayne Lewis, he even said he's the toughest man he's ever seen. You couldn't believe how much stamina he had. Uh, yeah. Especially with his ankle blowed up like that and still going. I guess when you got a kid missing like that, you are in mission mode. Said that right. You cannot concentrate on anything else huh. there's nothing else more important that's for sure i know 
But this uh, gunship that was flew in from Florida flew a three-hour mission, and it failed to detect any trace of Kurt. Hmm. And the plane was hampered by low-hanging clouds and heavy rains that grew so bad the searchers could not see their way out of the woods, and it had to be pulled out. Man, I'm telling you, it seems like every um, child uh, missing case that we do, as soon as something happens, it comes just starts raining like hell. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about Dennis Martin. Mm-hmm. Uh, Trini Gibson. Yep. I mean, the the weather impeded their search. Every time. Mm-hmm. Can't never get a drought. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Jill was saying that if someone had asked me beforehand how I'd have acted, she would say later that I would just go to pieces, but something happens to keep you going. Mm-hmm. You find reserves you didn't know you had. I just kept telling myself it wasn't going to do Kurt any good if I wasn't able to function. Right. Freaking out and not going to help nobody. Mm-hmm. She even said that it seemed that every time I turned around, the wardens were pulling Ron out of the woods because I was upset. Finally, I said, look, I'll tell you if I need him, but I'm going to cry. There's no way I'm not. Right. Wow. So basically, let him look. Leave him alone. I'm going to be over here doing my own thing, but I'm okay. Mm-hmm. And she preferred to search with her own friends, going out on gut instincts. And she would just look in holes, and people would go down in holes and look and wasn't finding no sign of Kurt. Yeah, she just knew she was going to find him out. And, you know, the next tree or the next hole, look, he's like, just, here he is. got to be in this one. He's got to be in this one. Yeah. But, you know, you got to got to stay positive. Mm-hmm. And as the days passed and absolutely no trace of Kurt was found, and a sense of reality flooded Jill, mm-hmm. it seemed that it was someone else's child and not mine, not our Kurt, she said. And at night was the worst time. I, I can't imagine, man. Mm-hmm. How do you how do you even go on? I don't know. Or how do you even leave that place? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'd be like I'd be like Ron. Yeah. And on the fifth day of the search, uh, Governor of Maine James Longley flew to the scene, and he promised the Newtons, "Anything in my power, I will do." He called the search, which had moved into extraordinary stage. Dale, it was even a shoulder to shoulder combing of more than. 2,000 acres. Can you imagine? Mm-mm. And it was the most impressive experience he'd ever had. Right. The amount of people looking for this kid. And this uh, aircraft, they flew out of Florida. This C-130H aircraft flew another mission, again, failing to detect any trace of Kurt. Right. But you know with the infrared, they, he'd have been there. They would have spotted something, man. Yeah, especially at night. Yeah. Now, the bloodhounds, they... Tried to pick up since. Right. And, you know, everywhere Kurt may have been, which were under some conditions, may have lasted for 10 days. And the woods grew so intense that Ron lost his ink pen twice in this underbrush. Right. And it was found. Twice. Yeah. Searchers found this ink pen. That's how close they were 